to an investor formulation and just to make sure that we know what we're going to be up to at the end of this video you'll be able to define the formulas for converting a recipe to a formula and we did a bit more of this part in part one of converting a recipe to an investor formulation so do make sure to watch that video we will use a basic formulation spreadsheet for tracking cost per gram and we'll use a basic formulation spreadsheet for converting classic household measures to weights and percents and, and last but not least, we'll define opportunities where yield calculations must be used to accurately represent the final product. So, I always joke with folks who have been watching this YouTube channel for a while that I used to go and agonize and edit out all these screen, uh, screen transitions and I have to make so many videos. I am having fun, but I, for the sake of time, I'm just pushing through. So. Those, Those of you who are following along with the course at Marriott College will have access to the templates for these um, for this initial uh, formulation spreadsheet. But uh, something that I talk about a lot in my teaching practice is what's called a cycle to mastery. That you have to start with a small number of tasks and add more complexity as you go along. So that's why I have a simpl simplified formulation chart in that it's got the, the, the basics involved. And, and then, then um, as, you as you get a lot more skill in this area, area we'll bring in some more complex um, formulation charts. charts. Some of them have been shared with us by different industry partners, partners and some, some of them have, have come to us from different corporations, corporations that, that they, they've, they've been generous to share information so that, that you can learn industry-relevant skills. But, but let's start small. Let's start, start with, with the basics so that you really know why you're doing each of these steps. and then, then you'll be really, really confident when you when, when you get this big, huge spreadsheet in front of you and you can see hundreds, if not thousands, of little boxes floating all over the place. You'll know why each of those boxes is there. So, first off, we want to have the date. Why? Because as product developers, you will often make a recipe once and you'll say, well, that was a great recipe, and you'll forget about it and not do anything. Um, good product developers have really great memories for the uh, products that they've made in the past. And, and they, they keep, keep really great notes. notes. I, I mentioned this in part one. one. Figure out what works for you. Personally, I go straight to spreadsheets because I find that I manage my data better. But secondly, I have had situations where my notebooks have been destroyed in floods or in other disasters. And when I have it on an internet uh, cloud base drive, then my files are always there. And I just find it easier and um, my, my handwriting's kind of lousy at this, so, so uh, a spreadsheet, spreadsheet works really, really well in that in that case. And the nice thing about a spreadsheet too is, as we think about looking here at what I call the version code, if I need to make some changes to a recipe, I can open up the old spreadsheet. I do want to make sure that I have a, a protection on that file so that I don't lose my old files, but I can open up the old file. And, and then, then make some modifications, modifications to that and save it as a new file, and, and I've got a new version. version. So that's, that's what I mean by version here, in that iteration, iteration, iteration I mentioned in the previous slideshow, is the idea of making small but significant changes to a baseline or a core formulation for the purposes of making improvement. And, and iteration is so important for product development. So for all sorts of different reasons, we could be doing iterations on this recipe. And, and one of the iterations that you may be looking at is this unit cost. So we'll, we'll jump in and do uh, uh, the calculations in a moment. But let's say you made this initial recipe, and maybe it was version 1.0, and it was fantastic. But you send this formulation spreadsheet off to your team, and they say, well, wait a second. Right now, the unit cost is um, $0.57 per unit, and we need it to be less than... 0. I don't know, 0. 0. 0.50 or 50 cents per unit. They totally could push back. And the nice thing about having this formulation is you can you can go in and 
fiddle around and reverse engineer those numbers so that you can figure out the cost and then present the product again in perhaps version 1.1 or 1.2 or 1.3. Many product developers will make their products dozens upon dozens of times, sometimes hundreds of times before it's approved to go to commercialization. And so keeping a version code is important. And, and oftentimes, oftentimes you'll make you'll make a product and you'll present it to your manager or director and they'll be like, well, that's OK. And, and then and then you do it 10 more times and they're like, oh, you know what? The first one was actually the best. And then, well, if you've got your version codes and you've got those files saved, you can go back to version one and repeat it. Let's jump into some of these other boxes. So ingredients here, we're naming the ingredients and giving some interesting and useful details. So milk. I'm not, I'm not just writing milk, milk, I'm writing milk. 2% from the supplier seal, seal test. The bananas. And I know that here it's peeled bananas, not bananas without a peel, or bananas with a peel as purchased, but bananas as prepared. My supplier in this case, Chiquita. Now I realize 2% milk in Canada is pretty much the same supplier to supplier to supplier from a commodity labeling perspective. But, but let's, let's say, say I'm, I'm not buying milk 2%, percent, I'm now buying, I don't know, um, the A2 milk, which has a, a unique protein signature, or maybe I'm buying Mitrell pure filtered milk for some reason. Um, I need to really pay attention to who that supplier is from a, uh, from a repeatability perspective. That uh, in some cases, the repeatability is really dependent on that supplier. So for example, my natural vanilla extract is down here from Clubhouse. Great, great brand. If, if I was to um, go, go into a different kitchen and they only had uh, vanilla from Nielsen Massey, Massey, I can guarantee you anything, it's going to taste very different because the vanilla from Nielsen Massey has a very different aroma signature than the vanilla from Clubhouse. And supplier could mean all the difference. And so do make sure to note that as, as much as is feasible. I realize that at the, at the college, some things like flour and sugar, you may not have a supply, uh, but you can also just note from the college. Now we put in the original measure. So in this case, we had some household measures. So imagine I'm making this banana milkshake. I put the, the, the blender pitcher on top of my scale and I would weigh out all right, so I, I measure that one cup, and then I'm going to weigh it as I'm pouring it into the blender. And in this case, we've got, let's say, 250 grams of milk, 92 grams of banana peeled as prepared, and 0 0.5 grams of vanilla extract. Now, nice thing about all these weights, I'm just going to scroll down a little bit here so that we can see the calculations down here. So down here, I have taken this column total and done the sum of the total ingredients. So 250, 92, and 0 0.5. And in this case, I would have gone down here. I know Excel really well, and I know those equations. You will have access to the filled document so that if you need to reverse engineer the equations, you'll have, you'll have this example file available to you in the Blackboard package. Then, then you'll also note down here, wait a second, why do you have a final weight post-processing? Well, uh, this was the weight that I poured into that uh, blender pitcher, but as I poured it into my glass, I had some yield loss. And this inevitably happens in every process, where let's say I'm not making this in the blender anymore, I'm now making it in a large, um, uh, a large, a large kettle with a immersion blender or uh, some sort of Cassini uh, emulsion mill. I'm, I'm going to lose material in my pipes. I'm going to lose material in the mill. I'm going to lose material in the immersion blender. And so I want to know what the final weight is post-processing and start to get a sense of the yield on my recipe time and time again. So how did I do my yield calculation? Well, I took the final weight post-processing, so D20, divided by D19. And in this case, I multiplied it by 100 up uh, to, to get, get a percent. percent. So I multiply by 100 to get a percent, and you're going to say, whoa, a lot of decimal points. But with my rule before, keep all your decimal points. points. You don't know. In, in the spreadsheet, they're not doing it. They're not doing any harm. And at a later point, I may need those decimal points. 
No, now, let's, let's jump over here to percentage. percentage. The, the nice thing about having a percentage, percentage on a formulation is that you can scale it very readily. So here I may be making just one unit of this smoothie, but let's say in the future I need to make a batch of, I don't know, 10,000 10, uh, 10, kilos of smoothie for a uh, bottle of milk. Well, I can take that percentage and I can back calculate so I know exactly what the weight is of each of the ingredients I need on a 10,000 kilo batch. So how do I do my percents? Well, I am going to take D9 and divide it by that total weight down here. So D9 divided by D19. Now you're going to say, why are there dollar signs in there? Well, that just means that if I take that and I copy it down, the D19 is going to stay there, but now D10 is the new, the new, um, the new value that's there. D11, as I copy it down, D19 doesn't shift as I'm moving down. And just to double check and make sure that my calculations are making sense, I did a sum. Now up here, I would have used, I would have used in home, I would have used the percentage formatting on these cells. If, if you, you don't, don't want, want to use the percentage formatting, you can multiply it out by 100 to express this as a percentage. Now, now I've got cost per gram. gram. Oh my goodness, wait a, wait a second, where did these values come from? I actually separated it into a second spreadsheet. Just to make the thought processes a little bit separate so that you can think through these two different activities. Now, I put it as a second tab down here on the bottom for you. Let's jump into this cost per gram calculation. So, so again, I've got, got my date, I've got, got the name of my recipe, recipe and I've got my version code. code. Uh, I should make sure that my version codes are lining up. But uh, my cost per gram often doesn't change as much as my formulation would when it comes to doing that product development. Oftentimes I only need to do this cost per gram once and then I'll have maybe 10 different formulations using those same costs. So again, I've listed my ingredients. In this case, I've actually added one more uh, column here. I've got my vendor. And in, in this case, case I put Sobeys. There, there are all sorts of different ingredient vendors in Canada. Canada. Pardon me. Most, Most of the time, if you're a food product developer, you're not going to Sobeys and buying ingredients at retail. You are going to an industrial supplier and purchasing large quantities, in some cases, uh, transport trucks or uh, shipping container loads of ingredients. In other cases, it might be smaller barrels or pallets or uh, polytotes of, of ingredient, and noting, noting who your vendor is is important so that you can, at a later point in time, call them back up and verify your costs at any point in time. And then, and then you also want to maintain who is your supplier. So, Sobeys sells steel test milk, Sobeys sells chiquita bananas. Same with the vendors that are out there selling industrial ingredients. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk about buying industrial ingredients at a later point. Um, but, but you want to put who is the actual, actual supplier of those ingredients. Some, Some cases, the vendor and the supplier will be the same. At, At a later, later point, we'll start to put in things like uh, catalog numbers or product numbers or even lot codes when doing these formulations. That, that way we know time and time again that we're getting repeatability on that ingredient. But for now, we're just going to keep it. We're going to keep it simple. And At a later point, we'll talk about lot codes. Um, and I'm going to put my total cost. So if I were to go and buy a four liter bag of milk at Sobeys, it's going to cost me $4.27. So $4.27 for four liters. And in this case, I'm going to make an approximation that four liters weighs four kilos or 4,000 grams. I realize that I should be doing a density calculation on my milk. However, I am working from home. I don't have my pycnometer or uh, analytical, analytical skill available to me. So, so again, again, I'm doing my best here. here. I should be doing a density calculation. Then, then I've got, got my banana. banana. And actually, I noted here, originally when I had the spreadsheet, I, 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 I had 125 grams here. And you're like, wait a second, I had 92 grams here. I bought a banana and it was 125 grams. And now I've got 92 grams in here. This is my as prepared banana. This, this is my as-purchased as banana. And there's, there's a few different ways you can manage this. this. You can do a yield adjustment, or you can manually adjust back out and say, this was my, the weight of my product. It's, it's, if I have 125 in there, though, 
that the cost, cost of my banana, banana is not accurate. accurate. You'll, You'll notice here, here right, right now it is 0 0.0024 or um, 0.24 cents per gram. gram. I know that sounds weird, weird that you're paying uh, a decimal fraction, fraction of a penny per gram, gram on a banana, banana. But, but it, it adds up. up. It, it adds up. up. It's, it's important to do these decimals. decimals. Versus, if I now have that 92 gram banana as prepared, it is no longer 0.2 cents, it is 0.032 cents, and the price is quite distinctly different. You do need to be consistent in how you're going to be tracking your weight on your product, and so, in this case, I put in as prepared. But, if you think about it, let's say you're scaling up and now you're buying a case of 10 kilos of bananas, You'll, you'll want, want to have a sense of what is the typical yield loss on that banana. Next, Next my vanilla extract, $4.99 for 500 mils. Actually, that's likely not natural, natural vanilla extract at that price point. Um, <laughs> but but uh, uh, hey, I, I haven't left, left the house, house in two weeks. So <laughs> I didn't actually go shopping. I had to make up some numbers off the top of my head. But um, I should not be fudging my numbers. I should be researching them properly. Um, I realize, I realize that going, going out shopping, shopping is going, going to be difficult for people at this point in time with the, with the lockdown. So, so again, I did the same for cost per gram. So D9 divided by E9. D9 the cost divided by how many grams in that package. And I should be also doing a density correction for the, uh, for the vanilla. Ideally, I am going and weighing everything, not just making up numbers off the top of my head. What, what I am going to do with this cost per gram is I'm going to copy it, and when I go back to my formula unit cost, I can paste it, but when I paste it, I want to make sure I'm pasting my values, not my formulas. Make sure you're pasting those values. So when I did the paste, paste, and it says paste values, and it's the little tiny clipboard that says one, two, three, paste values. Now I can do my unit cost. So I know, I know how many grams of milk I wanted in there, and I know my cost per gram of milk. So I can multiply 250 grams of milk, D9, times F9. So D9 times F9 gives me, in this case, 0 0.2668, or 26.68 cents. And I can do the same with my banana, F10 divided by D10. And we've got 0 0.3, actually. I, well, my banana was 30 cents in my mind. And last but not least, F11 cost per gram times D11. And it is 0 0.00499, or approximately half of a cent. And, and I, mean, I realize you're likely scratching your head going, who cares about half a cent? Well, if you are now making 10 million units, half a cent is $500,000, I think, isn't it? No, not. Ah, math is... Half a cent, and you're making 10 million units. Half a cent, 10 million units. 10 million units times 0 0.005. $50,000. Pardon, Pardon me, my math. math. <laughs> my PhD <laughs> is not in math. I need a calculator still to do <laughs> some of the basic arithmetic. Um, but $50,000, half a cent at this stage doesn't mean a lot. Half a cent, the moment that you scale something up, means a huge amount. And so do not round those decimals away. Do not round those decimals away. Last but not least, I can add up those, and now I know what my unit cost is for that recipe. And I could also do that unit cost with the yield correction, but for now I'm just going to leave it there. Now, I mentioned the word iteration a few times. Iteration just implies that we can make all sorts of different changes. Now that we've got a well-documented recipe, we can go back and I guarantee you, at some point in your career, your... Oh, oh, some manager is going to come in and say, well, that's fantastic. Your unit cost on a uh, milkshake is uh, $0.57 per unit, and we need it down to $0.50 per unit. You can go in and adjust these ingredients 
and figure, figure out what, what do I need to do, to or you can go in and, and figure out, do I change my vendor and, and haggle for a lower cost per gram on the different ingredients that I need to work with? You can, you can also, also think about it from a nutrition perspective, and, and, and this was one, one of the next themes. Now that we know how to document a recipe accurately, we will take these documents and start to do nutrition as part of that iteration. So we'll take this generate a nutrition facts table, and then we'll, we'll go back and say, oh, wait a second, there's not enough dietary fiber in that, or too much added sugar. Well, there's no added sugar in this recipe, but uh, you know what I mean. Um, too much sugar in there. What can we do to reduce the sugar? Or we need to increase the omega-3 fatty acids in this because the marketing claim that we want to make. This is where we're heading next. Now that we've got the ability to document a recipe, we can do all sorts of different iterations of the improvement of this recipe, and that will be the next part of our journey. So, all right. You know where to find me if you have questions. I love the feedback that I get on these videos. I'm having a ton of fun making them for you. I did, I did have, have one question from a student saying, well, what's, what's the software that you use for making your videos? And I just happen to work from a PC, and the software that I use, I'm just actually, just for fun, I'm going to jump out and show you. This is called OBS Studio, O-B-S Studio, and it's a free software package, and that is used for display capture, and I'm using the webcam from my computer to, in this case, use what's called display capture. And, and then, then I, I have, have uh, I have a wired mic, but I also have an embedded microphone within my laptop that would be able to do the audio capture and the display capture. And more or less, I just click on uh, start recording, and it records, and it records everything that's within that screen. And when I'm all done, I click on stop, and it saves a video for me. And honestly, it's it's been a really fun journey for me to figure out how to make all these videos. And, and OBS Studio is one of the tools that I use to be able to do that. And I do a little bit of basic editing using another uh, free software program called OpenShot, O-P-E-N-Shot, S-H-O-T. And OpenShot also is free, and it does some great different um, video editing features. And what I like about both of these pieces of software, besides the fact it's free, is that both, Both of these pieces of software have a lot of different tutorials. There's really great communities behind these pieces of software. And so all sorts of tutorials and blogs on how to do things better. So that's that's how I make my videos. And that was a really great question that someone sent me. All right, enough of me talking for now. And we will talk to you again really, really soon because I'm sure I've got more videos to make for you. Take care.